All right, well, I think we'll get this started. Welcome everybody. This is Julia Gerlach with Strip-Till Farmer, and I'd like to welcome you to today's Strip-Till Farmer webinar, Digging into Soil Health, the role of soil microbes brought to you by Holganics. Holganics' plant probiotics increase crop yields while simultaneously reducing the need for water, fertilizer, and chemical inputs. With Holganics, farmers can effectively cut their costs while producing more plentiful natural foods. We are fortunate today to have joining us Dave Stark of Holganics. Dave Stark is a molecular biologist and biochemist and has been the president of Holganics since 2015. And for today's webinar, Dave is gonna discuss best practices for building soil health, the role of soil microbes, crop performance and nutrient efficiency, how soil health can lead to improved profit for the farm and insights and data on incorporating soil health practices. Um, before I turn things over to Dave, I have just a couple of housekeeping items that I wanna make you aware of. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, there is a control panel with a Q&A icon, and that will allow you to submit questions at any time during the presentation. And we will get those questions answered at the end of the presentation. Um, then otherwise, if for any reason the webinar is disrupted or you're seemingly disconnected from the broadcast, just go back to the invitation email you received and rejoin the webinar through the web link in that email. With that said, thank you again for joining us. And now I'm going to turn things over to Dave Stark. Good morning. Okay, thanks, Julia. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining today. So we're going to talk about microbes and soil health. Um, so here's kind of an overview of what we're going to discuss. So first of all, um, my objective, there's a lot of microbial products out there. So I want to talk about what to expect from different types of microbes so that you can make an informed decision about which products that, that you might want to use because there are some really good products out there. And then of course, like a lot of things, there are some that, that maybe promise a little bit too much based on what biology they really contain. So I'm going to you know, help with that. Uh, I'm going to change a little bit of the focus on fertilizer efficiency because there's obviously fertilizer prices continue to go the wrong direction at least if you're a producer. And um, we wanna talk about the role microbes can play because it's significant. And again, that all plays into the whole soil health field. Um, we'll talk about some data and results. So I'm gonna you know, issue an apology up front because a lot of the data and results are gonna be with the product my company makes. And probably not surprisingly, that's where I have the best access to pictures and data. I'm not a salesperson, so what I'm trying to do again is to show you enough evidence what microbes do that you can understand that there's actually something there that, that you should consider. And like I said at the beginning, for you to help, help you understand what different types of microbes can do so you can make the most informed decision for your operation. So first of all, you know, microbes are absolutely required to build soil. So topsoil is built through the interaction of microbes and plants. And we'll talk about this in a, in a few slides, mostly plant roots. So, you know, in a good and real healthy situation, you know, plants and microbes work together to do this. When we don't have a healthy situation, um, and in a healthy situation, plants make a phenomenal investment in microbes. They spend 30% of their photosynthetic energy secreting food in the root zone to attract microbes because microbes access food in the soil the plant can't, so they feed each other. But when that gets disrupted by a number of different things, which again, I'll talk about, and the plants stop feeding the microbes or the food isn't there as plentiful, microbes can actually then degrade soil when the soil isn't treated right. And you know that's kind of that bottom picture where if we're not having a healthy situation, Microbes consume the organic material and organic matter in the soil. It goes down, down, down over the years. And, um, you know, it's, it's like it's a lot of ground I've seen. I lived 35 years in Missouri. Um, and so I'm very familiar with the ground. You can't get a shovel in. Water washes off. And it's basically just a solid support to hold a plant upright. So, you know, we'll talk about how this happens. But first, you know, I really want to tee up the whole issue with fertilizer because I know it's a big deal. It's a big deal even if you're not a, a producer and you just have a, a lawn that you're fertilizing. So these numbers are from the year 2020. Um, the U.S. fertilizer market, $18.6 billion. 
That's about 12% of the global fertilizer market. Um, I don't know what it's gonna be at the end of 2021, but we all know more than 18.6 billion. Over 60% is used on four crops, corn, soy, wheat, and cotton. And there's a lot of different data out there that measures this, but you know what's just really outrageous is over half that fertilizer dollar in a typical situation never goes to our crop or our lawn, whatever we're fertilizing, that it's lost to the soil, it gets tied up or it gets eroded, it volatilizes into the air or it washes off with our water. So it's incredibly inefficient. And given the price of fertilizer, we gotta get more bang for our buck. So many factors influence nutrient use efficiency. So I'm gonna talk about this and why soil health is, is one of those. And by the way, there's a lot of words on this slide. I apologize for that. You don't have to read them all. Um, there's a couple clear points. This slide talks about nitrogen and nitrogen efficiency. So in the upper half of the slide is like the, the punchline from a meta study. What a meta study is, it's when a researcher doesn't actually do hands-on laboratory or field work. Instead, they're looking at the body of published peer-reviewed scientific information on a particular topic. And here it's nitrogen use in corn, rice, and small grains. And what they found is only 36 to 42% of what the crop needs actually comes from the nitrogen we put down that year. I mean, this is a lot less than, than I thought, you know, before this study came out. I knew it wasn't 100, but this is a lot less. That in fact, it's actually soil organic nitrogen turnover that does more to feed the plants. All right, so we're gonna see this throughout my talk. And if you've heard me talk before, you know that, that I, I always bring this up, how scientists like to make up terms that are not everyday language. Soil organic nitrogen turnover. So what is that? It's microbes. It's almost all microbes. Some of it will be organic matter, you know, last year's crop residue, dead roots and such. We'll see that again in a, in a, in a couple slides, but it's mostly microbes. So what it's saying is when you apply fertilizer, especially nitrogen, but also PK, the micros, et cetera, the biology in the soil, eat it. And that's good because they tend to live within half an inch of a root. They immobilize it. So now it's not gonna volatilize or wash off as easy because it's inside a microbe. So they immobilize it. And then as those microbes that eat it first die off, those nutrients get channeled back into the plant. So we have the cycle. And there's a whole nother set of studies that shows biologically active soils produce greater corn yields per unit of fertilizer input. It makes sense. The biology consumes the fertilizer, keeps it in the root zone. So less, you know, in a typical situation, less than half goes to the crop. Now we're getting more than half goes to the crop. And when we talk about biology, and this is gonna be basically my punchline, um, the bottom part of the slide is a statement from a, another recent publication. These authors are from the Noble Foundation, which was born out of the, the big dust bowl, you know, down in Oklahoma and Kansas, you know, 100 years ago. They also spun off the Soil Health Institute. And what they're saying, it's a diversity of microbial inoculum. It's not single species, that this is designed to have a complexity of species. And in fact, in every teaspoon of really healthy soil, there's going to be thousands of species of bacteria, fungi, actinomycetes, protozoa, over a billion individuals. It's designed to be diverse. Um, so that's the nitrogen story. And again, we're gonna, we're gonna build on this. So what about phosphorus and potassium? Well, first of all, the numbers you see here are going to be averages because we talk about soil, you know, there's huge variability from soil type to soil type. Frankly, even across a, a field that looks uniform, there can be variability in soil types. But typically, the top six inches of soil will have a huge bank of phosphorus and potassium, total bank, but the available pool is tiny. So when you get your soil test, they may show you what the total pool is, and it's gonna look huge, but your available pool is always what's really, really small. 
and that's what feeds your plant. So it's there, the plant can't access it. However, microbes can. This is why the plant makes such a big investment in feeding the, the biology, because many bacteria and fungi can dissolve the bound phosphorus and potassium. They secrete things like organic acids or chelators, and they can then unlock it and make it available to the plant root. There are a lot of products out there, by the way, that talk about phosphorus solubilization, potassium release, and, and that's credible. Um, there, you can release a, a lot through the act, uh, action of biology. There's another source of nutrients also in the ground, especially when you're doing reduced tillage, and that's the residue we leave on top. So there's a lot of organic matter that's in that residue, especially phosphorus and potassium, depending on what, upon what the crop is. Um, by the way, none of that ever becomes available to next year's crop unless a microbe breaks it down to a basic chemical form the plant root can take up. So again, it's the biology in the soil that makes all these nutrients released that then helps feed the crop. So if we look, you know, just nutrient release crop residue. Um, so first of all, if you're growing corn, and these are averages again, you know, every ton of corn residue has a lot of nutrients, about 14 pounds of nitrogen, four pounds of, uh, of phosphorus, P2O5, a lot of potassium, 34 pounds per ton of K2O, and about three pounds of sulfur per ton. A 200 bushel an acre corn crop can have four or five tons an acre of residue. That's a lot of nutrients that's sitting on top of your ground. And so you're gonna see different products that are sold that um, are, are sold to break that residue down and mineralize it, basically turning it into uh, food for the next year's crop. So what kinds of products do you wanna look for to break crop residue down? Now, um, we have to look at carbon to nitrogen ratios when we think of this. So now we're gonna get a little bit nerdy in terms of science, um, but it's important because first of all, most of the products that are being sold to break down residue are just bacteria. Bacteria are good for the soil. They're necessary in the soil, but they're not complete. They're only one piece of the puzzle. One of the problems with bacteria only is they're nitrogen hogs. They have a very high nitrogen uh, requirement. In fact, they need one nitrogen for every roughly five carbons. So if we're gonna put bacteria down that need one nitrogen for every five carbons, and we're gonna break down corn, corn stover that only has one nitrogen for every 57 carbons, or worse wheat straw that only has one for every 80, where are they gonna get their nitrogen? Well, they're either not gonna do a very good job breaking the residue down, or they're gonna steal it from your soil. Or you have to apply nitrogen with the bacteria to accelerate the breakdown. But remember, we're trying to minimize nitrogen because it's expensive. So you don't want just bacteria breaking down residue unless it's a, a residue like alfalfa or, or uh, soybeans that has more nitrogen. But you know that's usually not a big problem. It's the corn and wheat straw that's the problem. You want the fungi and the protozoa because they have three to six times lower requirements for, for nitrogen. So if you're gonna break down residue, you need more than bacteria, you need fungi. Also fungi actually have the enzymes that break down the lignin and the hemicellulose that's in that real woody um, residue. Bacteria don't have those same enzymes. And last, you know, let's look at carbon. And I know, man, we've all been taken around and around in circles about you know carbon credits and such, um, you know. But the truth is, whether you ever get paid for it or not, you want carbon in your soil. Bacteria, when they eat, they burn carbon as CO2, just like we do. Fungi, though, when they burn carbon, they'll burn some as CO2. But fungi put out these mycelia that we're going to see in a couple slides. Those are carbon rich. So fungi actually will keep carbon in the soil where bacteria burn it off as gas. So again, there's a lot of advantages. Not only will you get better release of nutrients and breakdown of your residue, but you're gonna make the soil better when you have more than just bacteria. 
So now let's look at um, soil organic matter. And soil organic matter does a lot, not only for your crop yields, but also for fertilizer efficiency. And so <laughs> organic matter in soil is absolutely built and it's required to have microbes because organic material that's manure, crop residue, roots from last year's crop, anything that can be broken down by a microbe, they takes that material and turns it into organic matter. So microbes are required, they're not sufficient. This is another important point because people will say, you know, gee, if I use a diverse microbial product, does that mean that I don't have to do cover crops or I don't put down humic acids or I can now till my ground again? No, microbes are part of your toolbox. They're not the complete toolbox either. They're necessary, not sufficient. So when we look at organic matter, let's look at the three different components of organic matter. And you know we can think of them as the living, the dead, and the very dead. Uh, to keep it real simple, the living is, is easy. It's the microbes, earthworms, living roots, etc. You know, it's they're, they're what's actually working on the organic material to build the soil and to release the nutrients. The dead is the readily uh, metabolizable or decomposed organic material. Again, dead microbes, roots, plant residue, et cetera, manure. This is the source of the food. So if we go back to the nitrogen slide and we think about or soil organic nitrogen turnover, it's the dead that's going to be giving rise by microbial action to a lot of the nitrogen that actually feeds the crop. Some of that dead comes from the fertilizer, the ammonia and urea we pay money for it, put on the ground because the microbes convert it into organic material, organic nitrogen. What we don't want to overlook though is that very dead component of organic matter. There's a couple reasons. First of all, if you you may have heard of the term cation exchange capacity. So here we go again as scientists, we did it again. Cation, what's a cation? It's an atom or a molecule that has a positive charge. Okay, what is that? Ammonia, calcium, potassium, magnesium, iron. You get the point, they're nutrients. Not every nutrient, because nitrate is not a cation, it's an opposite, it's an anion. It has a negative charge, uh, just like phosphorus. But cations, and if you have cation exchange capacity, humic acid, which I'm sure you, you've heard of, that's heavily degraded organic material that is now stable carbon. Humic acid is cation exchange. Instead of, for example, the ammonia or the potassium or the magnesium, or the cation reacting with other things in the soil to where it's gonna sit there forever unless a microbe unlocks it, it lightly binds it. So that these nutrients that have a positive charge stay in a chemical form the plant root can easily tap into. Bottom line, the more of this very dead humus that we have in the soil, the better our nutrient retention. It also tends to hold water and, and microbes tend to, to grow around these as well. So we want all three of these components of organic matter. In organic um, matter has a lot of nutrients in it. So in the lower right-hand corner, you know, the data varies. So that's not to say your ground has all this. And very importantly, it doesn't mean that this is what's available this spring to your crop because it's not but it's in your soil bank. Each percent of organic matter has about a thousand pounds of nitrogen and hundred pounds each of PKS and a lot of carbon, you know, 11,500 pounds that hopefully someday you can get paid for because you really do put carbon in your ground when you farm. So when we talk about organic matter, we really have to talk about roots because we do a lot to leave residue on top of our soil, but it's actually the roots that contribute more to the organic matter, also to nutrient efficiency. So if you think of the root zone and all the dirt that's available where the roots are, about 1% of the soil is all that's explored. That's incredibly low. That means that there's a lot of nutrients within the root ball that 
because they're not up next door root, don't and, and come in contact with it, are not available to the plant. So the more roots, the more root hairs, the more nutrients we're going to get taken up. So products, and there are a lot of them out there that induce rooting, and it's common sense. Remember, microbes live in the root zone. Plants feed microbes. So microbes, what do they do? They not only feed the plant, they secrete hormones that tell the plant, hey, I like my house. I want it bigger. So they induce more roots. I mean, just look at the, the, the two roots on the right uh, in, in that picture, you know, which plant had access to more water, more nutrients, and which, you know, rewarded the, the, the grower with a bigger ear of corn, higher yield. Um, the other thing that we have to think about, though, is that uh, the roots um, contribute more to that dead and very dead component of organic matter than residue on top. Actually, two thirds of the organic matter in our soil comes from roots. It's not the stuff we leave on top, it's the roots. So if you wanna break up compaction, make channels for air and water, and by the way, everything you want growing in your soil needs air and water. You've gotta have roots. So don't just discount a product that, that gives you more roots but maybe you didn't see the yield at the end of the year because you're definitely helping your soil with products like that. So just kind of a case in point, this is a study that, that compares forest organic matter versus prairie organic matter. And so in a forest situation, you know, the tree roots grow, they don't die off and grow back every year, they stay there. So most of the organic matter that's added to the soil comes from leaf litter. And if we look in the left two boxes, the ones that are kind of gray and blue, it, you, know, you can see the percent organic matter. It's high at the surface and it drops off as you start going into the soil. That's because the surface organic matter doesn't get down that well. Uh, some of it does mostly by the action of earthworms, but otherwise it stays in the top layer. Comparing out of the right hand to the boxes, first of all, notice the scale is different. It's not one to 4% organic matter, it's three to 12. And why is it better in a prairie? It's because the grasses put out deep extensive roots, but then when winter comes, they die back. Now, what did we do? We just left active or you know, the dead uh, portion of organic matter for microbes to work on to now build stable carbon in the soil and build soil structure. That's why, if you, you know, with cover crops and such, deep rooted plants that then die back, you're gonna do better long-term for your soil. So let's summarize. Man, I just gave you a ton, I'm sorry, but we can make it simple. Microbes eat fertilizer. They keep it in the root zone. And if you have diverse microbes, they'll cycle it back to the crop. They also are absolutely required to take all the nutrients in your residue and manures or whatever else you're putting out there and release those to the plant and also build that soil organic matter, which by the way, not only increases your yields, your fertilizer efficiency, makes your ground more valuable too, because your yields are higher. Um, so I keep talking about microbes. What microbes? So here's a list. We're gonna talk about a few of these um, from the smallest, the most aggressive to grow in the most plentiful, which are bacteria, to the protozoa and nematodes, which are the largest, slowest to grow, the least numerous. Every one of these types is important to the soil. They have a role to play. So if you're gonna buy a, a microbial product that only has bacteria, just be aware, bacteria do some things really well. And if that's what you need done, phenomenal. But they can't do everything we talked about with building soil, organic matter, and cycling nutrients. They don't have the, the full capability. You know, all of these are there for a reason. So let's talk about bacteria. What are they good for? Well, bacteria are really good at breaking down organic matter. Now, the really woody stuff like the corn and wheat you need a little nitrogen or you've got to have the, the bacteria predators in there. They're also good at unlocking nutrients that are in the soil. So they'll solubilize 
P and K and S and iron. Um, some bacteria, this is not the same as the bacteria that live in your, in your soy root nodule. Those live inside the plant and they do take atmosphere from the air and they're incredibly important in a soy, alfalfa, a legume for providing nitrogen to the plant and to the ground. There are some bacteria that live in the soil. They're free living. They can also take nitrogen from the air. And you know, there's at least one company out there that's promoting this pretty heavy. And you know, the, the, the challenge is it takes a lot of energy for bacteria to take nitrogen from the air and turn it into something that's like a, an ammonia that they can then turn into an amino acid or a protein, something stable. Um, it's incredibly energy intensive. So it's just normal biochemistry. If nitrogen is present, the feedback is don't waste all that energy to take nitrogen from the air. You've already got what you need. You know, now there are some companies that I think are very clever, but what they've done is they've genetically engineered a couple strains of bacteria so that when nitrogen is present, the bacteria are still going to try, try to take it out of the air. And, you know, you've probably played with some of these products. Um, I'm not going to tell you if they're good or bad. I will tell you the challenge. The challenge is energy. Where is the bacteria going to get the food that it needs for that energy expensive process where they're like constantly running a marathon and they're burning calories, burning calories, taking nitrogen from the air. And, and I hope the company figures it out because you know, as a molecular biologist, I like genetic engineering, what can I say? But there's challenges. Uh, bacteria also good at inducing rooting. Bacteria are gonna outcompete everything in your soil for nutrients. Outcompete everything other microbes, your plant root, because they grow the fastest, they're the most plentiful, and they're gonna grab it first. And remember, they have a high nitrogen requirement. So when it comes to nitrogen cycling, they're good at immobilizing it in the root zone so it doesn't wash off, but they keep it in themselves, so we gotta get it out of the bacteria. And remember, bacteria tend to release carbon as CO2. By the way, when we till ground, and since this is strip till farmer, you know, I applaud you for not, you know, deeply tilling every year, you know, like we used to do. When we till ground, we give a burst of oxygen to the soil that favors bacteria because remember they grow the fastest. So they're going to get a burst of oxygen. They're going to start to divide. Also organic matter that are organic material, stuff that could be food for the, the bacteria that might be encased in soil particles. Now we've broken those up when we till, now more food is available to the bacteria. So we're gonna get a flush of bacteria growth. They're gonna dominate. And now we've got a very bacteria dominant soil where the fungi are gonna get hurt. So, and we don't want the fungi out of balance because fungi again are really important. They degrade organic material. They're actually better at it than, than the bacteria. Um, they consume bacteria. So bacteria are their food. So they help keep the bacteria in balance. They also, there are different um, fungi like trichoderma. And there are some products you can buy that contain trichoderma. Trichoderma live along the outside of a root zone and they eat other microbes, including a lot of soil-borne diseases. So they're, they're good in that respect. Fungi are great at finding water, unlocking phosphorus. You know, this picture is mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizae, you, you know, you may have heard of, they're really neat because they live, depending on the plant type, on or in a plant root because they're so tiny, tinier than the smallest root hair. They get between soil particles your plant roots can't. They increase the effective surface area of your plant roots 100 to 1,000 fold. Now think about that equation where in your root mass, the roots can only explore about 1% of the soil. But if you've got mycorrhizae working with the roots, you've really increased the amount of soil that can get explored. And the mycorrhizae are good at unlocking nutrients and feeding it to the plant because they get in turn fed by the plant. They also add carbon to the soil. When we till ground, we knock the fungi back, especially mycorrhizae. So we basically kill that network and we have to re-inoculate and give them time to get reestablished. So fungi 
Fungi are really important. Most of the farm ground that we work today, by the way, is bacteria dominant because we do till it. So we miss the fungi. And then I'm not sure you're going to find many products that have protists. There are some, and we'll talk about them. But these are generally overlooked, really important. Protozoa, amoeba, these are different cell types. They're predators. They eat bacteria. They eat fungi. They eat other protozoa. They eat organic matter. Now we talk about the, the, the nitrogen requirement of bacteria, five to one. Fungi are about three times less. Protists are about six times less. So that when they're eating bacteria, just like fungi, they got to get rid of the nitrogen. So I got to tell you, look, you, you may not hear many molecular biologists say this, and I can give, go on and on as a scientist where I see just, it's not millions of years of evolution. There's too many mechanisms in different species. And, and again, I've got a whole lot I could tell you as, as a molecular biologist um, where I am today. This is God's design. That is the best explanation that all of these things work together. And what happens when a protozoa eats a bacteria? It's releasing nitrogen. It has to get rid of it, just like we do. And how does it release it? What form? Ammonia and nitrate. What are the two forms of nitrogen your plant root takes up the best? Ammonia and nitrate. Where does all this happen? Remember, within half an inch of a root zone. So again, the design is to have complex biology because each piece plays a role in cycling nutrients, feeding the plants, and building soil. So do we have to add complex biology every year? Well, it depends, but generally, yes. Why? Well, there are some things we do that knocks the microbes out of balance. Tilling, like I said, you make it bacteria dominant. When we over fertilize or, or apply you know, some fungicides, but soil fumigants, which are meant to kill soil, then of course, we're really knocking things out of whack. When we over fertilize, first of all, if there's too much phosphorus, the plant will reject the mycorrhizal fungi. You won't get them to grow if there's too much phosphorus because the plant says, well, I don't need you. Why would I feed you? I've got all the phosphorus I need. Same thing with nitrogen cycling. So what is too much? I wish I could tell you because uh, it's different. It's on your operation and your soil. But if you've got diverse microbes, you can start backing off your inputs because the plants and the microbes will, will better take care of each other. You know, soil science, we're still at the bottom part of the learning curve. And it's embarrassing as a scientist, but it's true. And I'm going to shoot you straight. We're going to learn a lot in the next several years because we are now seeing how important this is. Freezing. All the microbes contain water. When you freeze water, it forms an ice crystal and kaboom. You burst the microbes, flooding, we, we lose oxygen. You can tell about 48 hours out underwater, uh, the, the microbes that need air die off, and then it, it smells like the bottom of a swamp. That tells you that ground is no longer biologically diverse. It's just a subset of microbes that, need, uh, that don't need air, that are facultative anaerobes. There we did it again as a scientist. So when you have flooded ground, you really are losing biological diversity. Um, you know, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna start going quick because I wanna get to your questions because I've got a lot of them, I bet you do too. You know, all crops need microbes with, I can wanna say it's an exception, but brassicas, you know, and there's a list here at the top, but we're starting to do more brassicas and cover crops. And brassicas are phenomenal because of the roots they put down and the biofumigation effect. But it's, that's bad because the biofumigation kills not only soil-borne diseases, but also beneficial microbes. So if it were my dollar, the first place I would not spend for a microbial would be on a brassica crop like canola. It would be following a brassica crop because there's studies that show that wheat yields, for example, are down after growing canola. And the researchers are saying because the beneficial biology has been killed back a lot by the brassica and you need to add it back. Okay, so now I'm gonna go even quicker into, into data and such. You know, I'm 
I spent 35 years in Missouri. I'm a scientist, so I'm a show me scientist. Um, you know, just a, a little plug about what is a diverse microbial. Our product is one. We have over 800 species of bacteria, uh, over 200 species of fungi, over 70 species of protozoa. So all the different things you see here, plant growth promoting, mycorrhizae, trichoderma, uh, protozoa, phosphor phosphorus solubilizers, they're all there. Other products like this would be aerobic, aerobic composts, aerobic compost teas, because they, again, tend to promote the growth of bacteria, fungi, protists all at once. You know, I, I've seen some people that want to make compost underneath plastic and they don't turn the pile. And I just go, why? You're excluding air. You're not getting the fungi, which have to have oxygen. You're not getting protozoa, which have to have oxygen. So ask questions of someone trying to sell you a, micro, a microbial product. Do they have just one species of fungi? Is it a yeast? Or do they actually have a lot of species of fungi that produce the mycelia, like penicillium and such? So that's what to look for. So you know, you're gonna see organics, but think diverse microbial product. So in turf grass, which is where our company started years ago, we know, and these are studies in Penn State, North Carolina State, Purdue, different soil types, different types of, of nitrogen. We can reduce nitrogen fertilizer a lot, um, up to 88%. Don't do this on your farm <laughs> because when we cut our grass, we leave the clippings out there. When we harvest a crop, we remove nutrients. The point is diverse biology helps more of the nitrogen you put down go to the crop. Because I can tell you the turf doesn't need less nitrogen. It's just, there's less waste in the system. Now here's an example. This is a pasture in Alabama. All the guy did was reseed with a fescue mix. At the top, that's, it's just the fescue mix. At the bottom, he added the diverse biology. Look at the difference. What this is showing is the microbes are releasing nutrients in the soil and feeding the plant in the bottom and there's not enough diverse biology in the top to get the job done. You know, we've done similar studies in corn. Um, in this first year, it was corn following soybeans. So the researcher only put 45 pounds an acre down of UAN for the whole year. And here he showed he could put down 20% less with microbes and get the same yield or put down, you know, the, uh, the same amount of fertilizer, 45 pounds, and get a lot higher yield. So you just, it's a tool that helps you play with the nitrogen. In the following year, corn on corn, it actually penciled out better to reduce the nitrogen 20%. Where, uh, so again, it's just a tool for you. Um, again, microbes induce rooting. I mean, it, this is night and day, and, and this is, you're gonna see from a lot of microbial products. Here's an example, this is from central Iowa, where all the corn got 180 pounds of ammonia plus 0, 060, 60. You can see the size of the check year. VRD is volcanic rock dust, micronutrients. That gave it a, a visible boost. In the middle, it's the same ammonia, 0, 060, 60, volcanic rock dust, plus the microbes. And you can see the difference, the microbes, had a lot more of the nutrient go to the plant and it rewarded the grower by having higher yield. Here's another example. So if we just look at the right-hand panel, there's a lot of potassium in a corn stock. If you remember from before when I've talked about this, then now there are a number of things that can cause the vasculature in the maturing corn stock to pull away. One of them is a potassium deficiency. Now I didn't test this particular grower's uh, corn, but you can see the difference where uh, on the left, the stock is absolutely strong, but the brace roots are thicker and stronger. But this could be a sign, again, of getting more potassium into the crop. And that's probably what's happening. Again, ye roots. If you're going to use a microbial product that tells you they induce rooting, you want to apply it as close to planting as practical. Why? Look at the lower left-hand corner. It's kind of hard to see because the roots are the same color as the dirt, but look at the difference in the roots between the check and where you use the microbes. And that just gets you know, better as the time goes on. And you know, 
as soon as you can get a root mass established, the more nutrients, the more water, the more stress response that crop's going to have. You got to get its feet under it. So the microbes are going to help you do that. Same kind of deal in potato, 20% reduction in fertilizer, higher payable yield per acre. Um, so I want to wrap up because I want to get to questions. So what are the recommendations? And there's a lot of them out there from, from different microbial suppliers. Some are saying don't use any P or K. I think that's aggressive, but it's not impossible because it really depends. And you know, if you've got an agronomist that, that can tell you, okay, you've got a total pool that's this, so you've got enough in the bank, using a product like this, you can reduce P and K. Um, you can also reduce nitrogen, but there's no set formula because there's I've seen so many differences. I, I got to tell you, I've got some customers that have cut 40%, but don't start there. They, they've been using a product like ours for several years and they're backing off slowly. If you're going above your removal rates or that you know uh, maximum return to nitrogen calculation, back down. If you've already decided I'm not going to spend all this money on fertilizer. You know, spending a little bit on a diverse microbial product can help you have more confidence that the money you are spending, you're getting more bang for your buck. So again, remember, it's diverse biology. If you really want to build soil, maximize your fertilizer input, and actually improve your soil without hurting your bottom line, you need bacteria, fungi, protists. It's the diversity that matters. So thanks for your attention, Julia. I'm happy to take questions. And by the way, that's my email there at the bottom. And people are, feel free to email me with, with questions, okay? Because I'm, I'm here to help. And if you, if you like our product, great. If I can help you choose between other products, that's fine. Because I'm a scientist and, and I'm just here to help you, you know, navigate everything out there, which is mind boggling. It is to me. <laughs> well, it's good to hear that it, it boggles your mind because if it boggles yours, it's okay for me to be <laughs> boggled as well. <laughs> but thank you so much, Dave. Uh, as always, you have a lot of fantastic information and you have got everybody thinking and they've sent in lots of good questions. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll go through these. Um, our first question is, can diazotrophs supply all the nitrogen requirement for a crop? And if not, can a cover crop resolve the issue? You know, I'm gonna wimp out again, but I have to be honest. And I think it's gonna be, it depends because there's so many things that go on in soil that compete for that nitrogen. And my, my gut reaction says probably no. But does that mean in any given year that the answer will be yes? Because I've seen it. I've seen people in regenerative ag situations not put fertilizer down and have really good results. It may not be the 300 bushel an acre corn, but do you want the top line or the bottom line? So I would just say, again, think of your cover crops and all these other tools and biology as your toolbox that lets you start working out what works best in your operation. And it may be different from you. And frankly, I would bet it is than it is the guy in the next state over. So yeah. sorry, I can't give you an exact answer, but I'm not gonna BS you. Yeah, no, that's fine. But um, for my benefit, at least, can you define what a diastroph is? Uh, if I'm thinking right, because there's so much going on, it's um, ancient biology that's that's in, in the ground that, that is a source of nutrients oh. without getting too complex. Gotcha. And if I've missed it, it's because you look at my hair, it's gray. So it'll, <laughs> <laughs> it'll hit me at two in the morning like everything does. <laughs> right. That little gray cell will wake up then and say, hey. Yeah. yeah. Hey, dummy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Ken Hilliard, obviously, is a member of your fan club. He has been uh, with, with us before. And he says he previously asked about mixing uh, with 3912 liquid fertilizer with two by two by two on the planter, and your reply was perfect. Um, and he's just asking, what if he adds sulfur, zinc, manganese, or magnesium to this cocktail? Are thumbs up, okay? And are there any 
additives to avoid. You had mentioned no fungicides in the mix, but what about fungicides applied foliar? No, fungicides applied foliar or on the seed coat, I, I think that's fine. I mean, you still have to manage to maximize your return. And fungicides tend to be specific to certain slices of fungi. So they're not broad spectrum. It's not like a roundup that kills anything green. So you're gonna set back certain types of fungi, but not all of them. You know, the other thing in an ideal world is you don't have a really high salt fertilizer. The microbes tolerate it really well, but you know, more and more, and I've had been asked this question and I've been looking at it. Um, I just think, you know, most microbial companies say use a low salt fertilizer and, you know, chloride in particular, it, it, it does set back microbes. Does it totally kill them off? No, they're self-replicating active ingredients. Um, but if I had my way, use a lower salt fertilizer. It's better for your seed too, in your ground. Okay, perfect. All right, um, next question. Does microbial inoculation really cause significant positive effects comparing to the massive existing native microbiome? Would there be a competition? And is feeding the existing native microbiome also an effective way to boost the soil microbes? Yes. <laughs> yes to all. So <laughs> now I've, I've been looking for scientific data and there's not as much out there that satisfies me. So first of all, the science I see is when you add one or a handful of species of a bacteria or a fungi with very few exceptions, they don't persist very long in the soil because they are overwhelmed by what's there. Now, there are cases though, where I've seen soil where there's almost no fungi. Mm -hmm. um, and also mycorrhizae are a little bit different in terms of how they work. So you can apply mycorrhizae as long as you're not then gonna till them up, you know, like growing potatoes and disrupt it. Um, so generally speaking, they do compete. When you add a whole biome, which is a product like ours or a compost tea, they're cooperative. They grow together. And it's and the science shows they will persist in the soil. Now, if you only apply it once through time, the soil is going to slowly revert back, is what I've seen. Mm -hmm. Does that mean every time? I don't know. Um, but I also know through repeated applications of a product, you know, like ours or a compost tea, people do show and they've seen their soil slowly get better. Remember, this is a marathon, this is not it's a sprint. And you can start backing off the rates and the applications. And if you get to a point where your biology is so good and that you don't need to add the products, great. Um, feeding the microbes is always a good idea because again, they need energy, they need food. So if you can't do cover crops or something else that gives food, then, then you know, adding the sugar is good. You know, in our product, we have a pound of molasses in every gallon. That, that's how we feel about it. You, you wanna feed them. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, Daniel Schwartz is asking, he says, you mentioned that two thirds of soil organic matter comes from plant roots. Is that just mm -hmm. in agricultural systems or in a natural system as well, such as forest and prairie soils? Well, prairie soils for sure. And if you remember the chart with forests, because unlike prairie grasses where the roots die back every year, uh, forest roots don't. So even though the, the tree roots are gonna secrete some carbon to feed microbes in the soil, it doesn't contribute very much. Most of it's the leaf litter on top. So it's really any soil situation. The primary contributor is going to be roots. Okay, got it. Um, the next question came in while you were on the slide regarding protists. And so the question is, which can be used for rot, root not nematodes? I, I'm assuming that that question was about protists in particular. Okay, um, so for nematodes, there's actually a couple different things that you can find in some microbial products. Um, one is there are a, a couple classes of nematodes. So we have them, some compost teas, you can buy them separately that actually don't eat the plant root at all. They eat other things in the soil, including the plant parasitic nematodes. There's also some biology um, that can actually predatorize and kill the plant parasitic nematodes. And, um, you know, we've actually just filed some patents on that in our product, but they're, they're available in other, other kinds of biology. So they, they tend to be different microbes can, can parasitize. Some of these you can buy, 
and so you can find out what they are. Um, and, and, and some I think you're going to find in the next several years, you're going to find a lot more natural alternatives to nematode control versus using genetics that have nematode resistance. And the genetics, especially in soy, are starting to break down. And nematicides historically have been kind of nasty chemistry and expensive. Mm. Although I think the chemistry started to get better. Mm. So I'd say today, um, it's one of the nematodes that you can buy that will control other nematodes. Mm. Okay, got it. Uh, next we have, has there been research on the beneficial microbes versus the invasive microbes that can infect the cash crop? What is the strategy to encourage beneficial microbes to stay healthy working in the soil to mineralize the nutrients for the cash crop uptake without becoming infected with the disease or nutrient deficiency? Yep, great question. So the answer is yes, there is a lot of research and there's a whole area, you know, um, the USDA, and I have a, a reference in my slides, which I will make available, and Julie, of course you can too, um, that talks about this, where soils, when you have a buildup of beneficial biology, become suppressive. And what a suppressive soil is, is when the, the, the pathogen can be present, but it doesn't cause the disease because it's being outcompeted by the beneficial microbes. So how do you get the beneficials? Air and water, not too much water. You need oxygen because those soil-borne pathogens tend to be the microbes that can survive without oxygen. So if you've got a flooded field or one that's too water saturated, then you can tend to get more of the soil borne diseases. But if you have soil that has good structure, which means you know, you've got roots that are breaking up compaction that are adding organic matter and, you know, and good you know, structure when you, when you hold it um, in oxygen, then you're gonna build up those beneficials. If you're gonna buy a microbial product, you want one that was grown with air. So if you've got something that claims to be biologically diverse, but it's in a sealed container and it's shelf stable, and if you open it, you wanna throw up because it smells terrible, that's not it. <laughs> that's anaerobic. Mm -hmm. So you want something that's stored that needs oxygen, and that's the key. Okay, great. Um, next we have, is it useful to apply more microbes to the natural system microbe herd? Um, will they play together well? And will you get an ROI applying microbe products in an already healthy system? Yeah, you, you, you do. And I've asked soil scientists, I'm like, so I've seen, and by the way, you know, a product like ours, I would say, use it on your worst ground first, because that's where you're most likely to see the biggest percent ROI. Then I've got guys that are going from 250 bushels up. I don't even want to say it because it's not a promise, but they're getting a lot higher yield on really good ground. And I don't know why. No. What is it that the biology is missing? And is it because they're in places that had a harsh winter? So we're just kickstarting it. I think that's probably the most likely explanation um, that it's places where, you know, right now it's still frozen and the biology will recover because there's some cold tolerance in there, but it's not the same across all the different types. So you kickstart it. And yeah, you're right, by August, your soil's probably very healthy, but maybe not in April or May when you plant. It just hasn't all recovered, but I'm speculating. Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen the data out there that really defines it. So I would say, again, you gotta try it on your ground and see what it does for you. Okay. Um, this question from Ken Hilliard is uh, maybe a good follow-up to that. It says, what about spot treatment in small 1,000 to 10,000 square feet poorly drained areas? Specifically, he sees um, areas in a wheat field where heavy rain, he, they got heavy rain and then it froze before the water drained away. Um, and then he's asking, also asking about what about fall application on cover crops and how far before killing frost? Okay, that's great. And, I've, and you know, I've had some customers that only apply it to ground that's a river bottom and such because they do tend to get more flooding. And there you definitely know that you're, you're losing a lot of your beneficials, especially fungi and protozoa that have to have oxygen. So that's a great idea. And you may have ground where you don't see the same ROI and maybe don't want to apply the microbes and that's okay. 
because the whole the whole objective is to maximize your bottom line. Mm -hmm. um, cover crops, absolutely. So if you're in a place where you know it's a race between harvest and winter, then microbes will um, they not only induce rooting, they induce germination. So you can buy microbial products that will help you get that stand faster. Just remember the rule of thumb. If your plant isn't growing anymore because the soil is too cold, neither are the microbes. So that that's really your key. And you know, 50 degrees Fahrenheit is kind of a, a, a rough uh, line that, that we tend to use. You know, there'll be some microbial activity before that. But frankly, if you're going to be you know applying microbes a week before a deep freeze, I probably would wait till spring. I would wait till spring, not probably. Sure. Okay. Got it. Uh, the next one's very specific. Is potassium made available by bacteria or by fungi? And what's the best product to solubilize this nutrient? Uh, both can do it. Okay. Um, I, I, know, I know there are definitely bacteria products out there, and there are bacteria that have been shown scientifically that can release pot uh, potassium. So can fungi. So it really depends upon, you know, what the sales rep is, is, is showing you, but, but it's very credible that it can be either or both. Okay, got it. Um, next, the question is, is there any syn synergetic impact when the microbes, especially microalgae, bacteria interact with, especially microalgae and bacteria when they interact with each other? And what is the role of the microbe interaction from a crop production standpoint? Boy, that's a great question. Yeah. And, um, I have, and algae is probably where I've done the least amount of research, but algae are also really interesting because of course, a lot of them take sunlight and produce food and also nitrogen. And the bacteria, when those algae die, are, are gonna help release that. So they will work together to cycle the nutrients in the algae back to the crop. So if you ask me again, I, I go back to what uh, I said at the beginning, and what every soil scientist tells me, all the different microbial types are there for a reason. So, so you want them there because they play different roles. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, next, if we're utilizing more soil nutrients and the microbes are releasing some of those nutrients to be more readily available from the soil bank, will we eventually use all of the storage and go back to applying the same amount of fertilizer as before? Or are we just increasing the efficiency of the fertilizer usage and having less loss? Well, if we never put nutrients back, they, they don't appear by magic. Um, so yes, well, we would run out. Now, a lot of the nutrients are going to be there for a long time. Still, I know you don't want to you know, take all that. And then for future generations, they have a problem. You know, the only macronutrient that really can get added back is nitrogen because bacteria can fix nitrogen from the air. I, I, don't see, at least in today's situation and technology, where that totally replaces the nitrogen fertilizer we apply. Now, in combination with the legume that's also doing that, you can get to a point where maybe, you know, you're just penciling it out and you're, you're using very little. Now, my whole point with microbes is it's a tool where we don't have to over apply, where there's so much wasted in the system that let's, we've got a lot of room to save and not hurt yields and not rape the soil just by having good biological activity. So you're going to find that balance and where that is for your ground, you're going to you know, have to find out yourself, but you can, we all can definitely do better because we're, we're losing dollars to inefficiency. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, a quick note, it is the top of the hour, and Dave, I know you said you can keep going if um, we do still have some questions outstanding, so if that's okay, we'll just keep going and, you know, people will uh, say goodbye if they need to, but um, we're going to continue answering questions. Um, so the next question is, should I apply organics to my oak cover crop as well as in my furrow cash crop uh, of corn, or if I do just one, which should I choose? I would do your cash crop if you're only going to do one. Okay. You know, if your oat cover crop, if you've got issues getting it established, um, we have great results in oats, but that's really up to your operation and what you're trying to accomplish. But definitely your cash crop first. Yeah. 
Sounds like good advice. Um, next, any relationship on microbial activity with soil pH? Well, yeah, microbes like your plants tend to like things toward neutral, but at the same time, microbes have an amazing range of pH. That doesn't mean every species, but what we do need to remember is in, in the design of things that I see you know, in us and in soil and everywhere, there's functional redundancy. So if you've got a pH that's out of whack, you know, the, what might be doing a certain function at pH seven may be done by a different microbe at pH six or pH eight. But um, microbes are amazing and through time tend to bring pHs back to neutral. Generally speaking, that's, that's what we've seen. Okay, great. Um, and then somebody's asking for just a little more explanation. He said, don't know if I heard this correctly, but do some soil fungi prey on soil bacteria? Absolutely. That's a, that's a big role that fungi play is bacteria is their food. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's important because otherwise, again, they won't wipe the bacteria out. The bacteria are far, I mean, in an ideal condition, bacteria species can double every 20 to 30 minutes. And you think about after 24 hours, it, you, it's exploded. But the, the fungi, the protozoa tend to keep them in check and in balance because that's their food. Perfect, okay. Uh, Jerry is asking, you said freezing kills microbes. How are there any available for the next year after a cold freezing winter? Okay, so it knocks them way back, but it depends because you see in a place like Minnesota or Wisconsin, if we look at your soils, there's going to be um, freeze tolerant species in there. However, it won't be every different species of bacteria or fungi in there. So we, we, we put them out of whack. It doesn't take them to zero though. And so it depends, you know, there's gonna be some microbes maybe below the frost line, um, but they will, the activity definitely will be a lot lower. They will recover. How long? Honestly, I haven't seen good studies and I bet if we did 10 studies, we'd have 10 different results. Absolutely, okay. Uh, next we have, uh, have you noticed the cash crop having an improved bioaccumulation in a healthier, higher microbial active system, better quality, higher nutrition in the cash crop, forage, fruit, for the animal or human consumption? Absolutely. So it's not uncommon to see um, higher bricks. Bricks are sugars and acids. Now that also tends to give us flavor. So especially if you have the sugar acid ratio towards sugar, if you like sweet more than tart, um, it also tends to repel piercing sucking insects because they're, it's, uh, it's not intuitive, but they don't like sugar. And I would think that's what they want, but that tends a, a healthy plant with higher sugars repels those. So we, we absolutely see um, higher nutritional values. I've had customers tell me using different products, they see higher protein. That's really interesting. I don't have side-by-side -side data that, that proves that we're, we're, we're trying to generate that because if microbes intellectually should do that, but if we can reproduce it, that's money in your pocket. Yeah. But absolutely. I can't promise it yet. Yeah. Right, right. Now that there's some really interesting uh, research done, being done on that whole bricks thing and the, the insects, uh, really interesting mm -hmm. stuff. Um, Brett Girk is asking, how much have you seen soil organic matter increase percentage wise by using microbial products? Yeah, see, I haven't seen really good studies either because it depends what else you're doing. So uh, are, you, are you in a place where you've got um, cover crops? Are you spreading manures? Are you tilling? So um, it's, it's hard to say. I just know that I've, I've spoken with people and also it, you know, for our company, for example, we started in the turf industry um, in 2010, but the founder was the biggest customer of this product years before that when he was fertilizing lawns. Um, he's got ground now that he says is phenomenally better that he adds very little fertilizer or microbes to, but it took 20 years, but it's a nice journey to be on because that's making your ground more productive and more valuable. But yeah, there's no set formula. Got it, okay. Um, 
and this is sort of a general question, but do you know of what is the best or better soil test to determine reliable phosphorus levels? Oh, wow. <laughs> no, I really, I don't have necessarily a favorite. I think that, you know, um, I've heard producers tell me and complain that it, they need to know which lab they send to because labs will give different results that need to be interpreted differently. Now we're getting outside of my area of expertise. I'm just telling you feedback as a member of the Soil Health Institute that I've heard. So I think many labs are credible, but understanding how their results really work, that's, they should be doing that for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, and then this next question might be, I'm um, not sure if this is applicable to what we're talking about. What dosage of malaise could be applied per acre? I'm not sure. Uh, M-E-L-L-A-S-E. I'm not sure. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with it. I don't okay. know. All right. Sorry, <laughs> Ernestus. We're not sure what that what that is. Um, next, we've got, does a plant and its microbes growing in a diverse polyculture have the ability to prov provide all of its own nutrition? Hmm. Well, yes, because all we have to do is look at any wild place. Yeah. So between the microbes and, uh, and, and the diversity in the soil uh, and the plants, they, they do feed each other. Now in a crop system, where we're removing nutrients, that's more of a challenge. But in a natural setting, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, Jenny Coleman asks, uh, you might not know anything about mango trees, but if I spray a foliar fungicide on my mango trees, what is the impact to the soil fungus? Do I need to replace the fungus? And how long should I wait to apply it? Yeah, you know, what I've seen um, is you don't. Even if you're getting some wet into the soil, um, the, the studies I've seen, and are they really comprehensive and such, that, that's debatable, but I would say no. I'd say as long as you're, it, it's a foliar application and you're getting into the surface of the ground, the fungi are, you know, some may get set back a little, but not deep into the ground, especially where all the tree roots are. Okay, good. Good guideline. Um, all right, would phosphorus solubilizing bacteria supply phosphorus for plant roots or mostly just for itself, as I heard that bacteria are selfish? Bacteria are selfish, but um, they, they will provide it to plant roots. And I know there are some bacteria only products out there that are phosphorus solubilizers, and I don't have personal experience with their performance but I've met some of the people and they're pretty good agronomists. And so I think they're pretty trustworthy. So I think if you wanted to buy a product that just released phosphorus and it was just bacteria, um, I would expect that product to deliver what your salesperson tells you. And if not, ask them why not, but there's no reason it, it, it shouldn't. Okay, great. Um, what about saline areas? Does, how does your product work on saline areas? It actually works really well. Um, so we have a number of golf of courses that are along oceans that have been using us for years because of course ocean spray is salty and that really burns the grass. But I've also got some, some people that I've worked with in places where they say, you can see that the top of the ground is white because the salt has percolated up in the water and it's dried and you can't grow anything and they use a product like ours and they can. Now they're not busting, you know, yield records, you know, don't make a mistake, but they're getting crops. And that's what we've seen is the microbes can help tie up and sequester salt. It's not going to happen in one application, but, but the microbes will help with, with a salt situation. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Um, Tim is asking, does frost affect endo and ectomycorrhizal communities the same? Thinking deep perennial clover and fescue roots would provide symbiotic relationship. Well, that's a good question. I've never seen the data on that. Okay. My guess is, um, boy, if it's light frost, I would think if the plant is not damaged, so we didn't get water crystals inside, then the endophytes have probably done better than some of the ectophytes. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. The ectophytes, I imagine some of them would be set back, but the ones below the frost in the ground probably just continue on happily. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
but I've not seen no data on it. That's a good yeah, question. It is. An, it's interesting. I hadn't thought of that either. Um, and John Wiseman, by the way, says, thank you. Good presentation. Loves your honest answers. Oh, thanks, John. <laughs> uh, let's see. Martin is asking, what type of microbial product would you recommend for an existing grass pasture? Well, again, on grasses, you want the same thing. You want the, the diversity because if it's a pasture that has been grazed, it's going to help keep that manure in the pasture and it's gonna break down you know, uh, any thatch that's accumulated. Basically, you're gonna get um, a burst of roots and a burst of nutrient release that's gonna contribute again to keeping the nutrients there. We've got a number of uh, pasture customers that, that really like the product. And again, remember, we cut our teeth on grass. So I'm not allowed to say, uh, because it sounds like an endorsement, but a lot of Major League Baseball, National Football League, and college stadiums are customers, as well as if you're watching golf on TV, they're probably a customer, oh. because we help with recovery oh, gotcha. after play. Okay, good, good to know. Um, okay, we've got Ken Hilliard again. What about application with a strip till bar six to eight inches deep? And what pressure can the product handle? Piston pumps cause pressure spikes as they cycle. Can this be a problem? It can be a problem. So high pressure in small screens like 80 or 100 mesh can shear microbes. Will you sterilize the product? No, um, but it's better to have as low a pressure as practical with as large a screen like 50 mesh or, or, or larger, understanding that you, know, you still have to do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. um, going eight inches deep, um, I'd say if you're if you're putting any kind of fertilizer product down there, or you've got something for the microbes to live on, that's great. Otherwise, they're going to mostly sit dormant until the roots hit it, and then they'll start colonizing the root zone. Okay, all right. But I don't. Yeah. I have, by the way, I don't. I have no experience with anyone putting the product that deep, other than planting a tree or something. But that's not the same. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, a lot of strip tillers will do their berms in the spring. You know, they'll do their strips in the spring, six to eight inches, put their nitrogen in or, you know, their nutrients mm -hmm. in. So that's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that probably would work. That would work. Yeah. OK. Um, we have Flavio saying, I was surprised to see a commercial product that contains beneficial nematodes and protozoa. How are they produced in industrial scale? Well, so. They, they grow in our fermentation process, okay. which is just a large batch. And by the way, it's not just put everything in there, walk away and come back after a certain period of time. I mean, our particular process, we're changing temperature, pH and food sources very deliberately through the process because we know the conditions that produce the growth of certain families of microbes that we're trying to achieve. And so anyone doing a, a fermentation process to grow specific pieces of that biology would do the same thing. Um, they, they just know what the conditions are. Nematodes are going to be a, a little bit slower. And so I think that's probably why, it, uh, well, I don't want, I was going to say that they, they may cost a little bit more just to get a nematode product. I'm not sure that's true because I haven't really exhaustively searched it. So I, I, I'm going to not say that. Okay. All right. Um, how about if you have only a limited supply, this is your recommendation, which crop might you give, uh, might give the best return, wheat or grass for seed production? I'm sorry, wheat, grass for seed production or sugar beets? Boy, that's a great question. I would say um, <laughs> the, the, the crop that's got the highest per acre value. Yeah. <laughs> but I would look at it a different way. Um, the ground that you struggle with the most. Mm -hmm. That's a good answer. All right. Um, Cody's asking if I'm growing a mixed species cover crop, oats and pea based and four to five brassicas, is there a number of brassica species or the other species that we can plant that won't inhibit microbial activity? You know, I haven't seen that because all the studies I've seen are with like almost a, a brassica monoculture, you know, oh. like a canola or uh, so if you're mixing and you've got you know, radish or something in there or a turnip in your cover crops, I'm honestly less concerned that you're really biofumigating the soil, but I don't know enough, you know, is it 8% of your mix, 5%? I, 
it's probably not 50. So it really depends on the percent mix because the biology is resilient. Um, I still think you know, you're know you gonna get more of the nutrients from your cover crop released to your next crop if you've got biological diversity out there. So that's the reason to do it. But I, I like mixed cover crops. And I, it, it, if I were a producer and I could, that's what I would do. Yeah, okay, great. Um, easy one here. Are your products registered in Canada? Yes, we have CFAI, CFIA approval in okay. dealers in Canada. Perfect. Okay. Um, and then we have a couple that came in over the chat also. Um, Becky's asking, has there been research on the beneficial microbes versus the invasive microbes? Or did we already do this? Um, oh yeah, I think we did that one, didn't we? Yes. So, so one, one question that I get asked a lot is, you know, what about the native species? Do you overcome them? I actually just had that conversation this morning with someone in Canada. Oh, um, okay. And they're great questions. I haven't seen enough data to say that we should be concerned. Unless, of course, we're bringing in anaerobic microbes that could include a lot of soil pathogens. So ours are 100% plant-based, aerobically grown. And by the way, we DNA fingerprint, so we know every species in our product, as you should expect from whoever you're buying your microbes from. I, and I'm sorry, I'm kind of going off on a tangent. You can't always rely on the label. And I know that there are competitive products that have more biology in there than they put on the label, just like us. And it's because state labeling laws, and I could, I'm not going to get on a soapbox, but they're so restrictive in some states that we yeah. can't. They don't let us. And it's nuts. So you really have to ask the manufacturer what's in there. Mm -hmm. And okay. they should tell you. And if they don't, that's a red flag. Gotcha. Um, can you recommend a testing service to validate the species consortium existing and also after use of a given product? I, well, I can. I know there's companies like Trace Genomics that will do a, a, a DNA fingerprint. They'll do a good job. They can do it from the product or the soil. And there are others like that. My only caution in doing it in the soil is don't overinterpret the data because the variability not just week to week, but foot to foot across the field. And it can be influenced by what's growing in there now, what grew in there last year. I honestly don't know what to do with the data unless it's like someone I spoke with a couple of days ago that said, I did a soil test and, and I, it came back and I have almost no fungi. Now that's useful because sure. now you need to do things to bring fungi back. But if it's species A versus species B, yeah. You know, we, we just don't know enough as a scientific endeavor yet, generally speaking, to tell you that you got a problem or not. Right. Because we just don't entirely know what they what each individual thing does right. or what the function is and what right. what it means. If do, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Exactly. But we do know we want a lot of biological activity and diversity. Yes. So that that we can say. Right. OK, great. Um, two more questions, it looks like. Uh, one is, do you have a chart that shows which herbicides and pesticides can be uh, applied with Holganics? We do. It's on our website. There's a compatibility list. Oh, great. Generally speaking, anything but a fungicide. Okay, perfect. All right. And then uh, one more. Any experience with Camelina and which crop would it work best with? I have limited experience with Camelina. I believe it's a brassica. So I was going to, you know, I, I had a slide that brassicas tend to reject, well, they reject mycorrhizal fungi, they sterilize the soil. And so I wouldn't necessarily use my product on a brassica. And then I've spoken with customers that said, oh no, I grew kale or I grew some brassica. I saw a great response. So you see, it just shows how much I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's just, there's a lot going on. So, um, these are just things in your operation you got to test. Camelina is an interesting crop. So um, if you've got a place where you've got a market for it and such, you know, that that's interesting. There's some nice properties about it. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, uh, several people have chimed in to say thank you so much for the great 
information transfer and common sense answers and things like that. So uh, looks like we've answered the questions. Um, so Dave, thank you so much for all of your fantastic information and uh, your patience to get through all of the questions thoroughly. Um, so for everybody who's left with us yet, uh, before we conclude, I just wanna give you a little heads up. We will send you a questionnaire to complete um, after you log off. We'd love it if you'd fill that out. It will help us with planning for future webinars. Um, and as a couple of you have asked, we yes, we will be making this recording available. It will be up on our website later today, and we will send out an email to let you know that it is that it's up there. Um, so once again, I'd love to thank Dave Stark for leading this discussion and thank Holganics for sponsoring the webinar. So Dave, thank you so much. I'm so glad you could tune in from Cal um, Florida. And I hope you have a lovely day. Thank and you thanks. so much. Thank yeah. you, Julia. Thanks everybody for for uh, for watching. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks everybody for for joining us. Have a great day, and hope uh, planting season gets off to a good start for you soon. All right. Take care. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, bye bye. Bye.